So, good evening, everybody. It's the end of a, a long first day of PCR London Valve, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's seminar, uh, supported by Edwards Life Sciences, focusing on the breadth of intervention across the aortic, mitral, and tricuspid valves, and examining in some depth the issues relating to the lifetime patient journey faced by many of our patients under our care. About 10 years ago, some of us were predicting an epidemic, not relating to COVID and viral infection, but relating to the expanding clinical problem posed by valvular heart disease. A projection that was based upon data that we accumulated in Oxford at the time, suggesting that there would be a doubling of the number of patients with heart valve disease over the coming decades, relating firstly to increased patient awareness, secondly to improved diagnostics, and thirdly and perhaps most importantly relating to the aging patient population. These projections have been swiftly followed by a rapid uptake in transcatheter interventions and as illustrated here in data from the STS TVT registry, a doubling of the number of aortic valve interventions across a seven-year period, suggesting a major area of unmet clinical need. And in this session uh, this evening, paired with a following session tomorrow morning, we will be examining the challenges faced, uh, facing clinicians who are dealing with this expanding patient population on a day-by-day, week-by-week basis. We will be looking at the new paradigms that uh, challenge us in relation to the longevity of patient management, ensuring that we perform the first intervention correctly and to the best of our ability to afford the best long-term outcomes and to plan for the second, the third, and maybe even the fourth intervention over a pa patient's lifetime. We will also be focusing on the major challenges presented by durability, not only to clinicians, but also to engineers and our industry partners. And we'll be looking at specific considerations, particularly pacemaker requirements and coronary access that are of fundamental importance at the time of our interventions. To do so this evening, I'm joined by an excellent faculty, both here in the studio and also joining us online. We will receive talks from Endrik Trida from Germany, from Francesco Sire in Italy. We will have a film video contribution from Mark Spence in Ireland. And we'll have a final presentation from Fabian Praz, Switzerland. And I shall be ably supported by Phil McCarthy, a long-standing friend and colleague, who will be moderating the session and providing liaison with the online chat. The faculty are demonstrated here. You know them all extremely well. And we're also grateful to Philippe Genereux from Canada, who will be providing some interface uh, with the chat function online. So Phil, tell us a little bit more about the moderator's role and what expectations we have of the session. Great, thank you, Bernard. Um, well, as ever, we want people to interact and ask questions and get involved. It's great to see a studio audi audience here uh, it's lovely to, to, to get a taste of what things used to be like. Uh, but I must remind you that you can't put your hand up and ask a question in the conventional old-fashioned way. You can ask questions if you're in the, in the audience via the app. And of course, our online following can ask questions via the chat function. Uh, Philippe is already online waiting for your questions. Uh, and we will answer all of your questions. If we don't answer them live and integrate them with our discussion, Philippe will answer them uh, as we go along. Uh, so, so please don't uh, be shy, ask questions as much as you can and, and get involved via the chat function. So I think it's now down to me to, to introduce Bernard's first talk. Uh, Bernard's going to just summarize the new ESC EA CTS guidelines, finding the best treatment option for each individual patient. I think this will set the scene nicely for the session. Bernard. So thank you, Phil. And if we could return to the slides, uh, the guidelines have been an important theme this year in the field of valvular heart disease. 
emerging from the European Society in September of this year, published in the European Heart Journal and presented simultaneously at the European Congress in Amsterdam in the autumn. Following on from the American College and American Heart Association guidelines published approximately one year beforehand. This slide uh, provides you with the reference and also demonstrates the wide breadth of the guideline task force, embracing not only interventionists and cardiac surgeons with interest in the field, but also imaging specialists and clinicians uh, who are active in this clinical area. Importantly, also for the first time, the task force was supported by a team of statistical methodologists who provided important insight into the design of the clinical trials which underpinned the recommendations and pointed out not only the strengths of the available evidence, but also in pointing out the abundant weaknesses in the trials which underpin our current management. The key messages that emerged from the guidelines are summarized here. Firstly, the fact that valvular heart disease remains a Cinderella discipline that requires greater publicity and greater awareness, not only amongst uh, general physicians, general cardiologists, but also amongst family medicine specialists, and perhaps most importantly all of all, in the minds of the public. A call for uh, greater access to care, greater access to specialists, and a call for the delivery of treatment in dedicated valve centers with appropriate levels of expertise and volume. A call for decisions to be made by multidisciplinary heart teams, a, a, a consistent theme within the European guidelines over the last decade. And importantly, in relation to mitral valve disease and increasingly in relation to aortic stenosis, uh, a demand for earlier intervention in the natural history of the disease to alter the adverse prognosis that these patients face. And finally, for the first time, an emphasis on the involvement of the patient in, in increasingly their family in the decisions that clinicians are making on their behalf. And this paradigm for patient-centered care, focusing on the individual clinical imaging and anatomical characteristics of patients by means of multimodality assessment and the involvement of the uh, patient themselves in the conclusions of the heart team to determine the uh, clinical journey is a fundamental call to arms from the European society. And nowhere was this more the case than in uh, significant aortic stenosis where it is clearly recognized that there is a major paradigm shift in the uh, options available to patients. Obviously, with the emergence of TAVI in the last 10 years and the maturity of this intervention as an option for patients has a major impact on our daily clinical practice and the decisions that we face as a heart team. It's difficult, perhaps, for you to read this slide on the screens, but the fundamental uh, axes of decision-making relate to the presence or absence of symptoms, the presence or absence of left ventricular impairment, and the feasibility or the futility of performing intervention, particularly in elderly patients with high degrees of frailty. And for the first time in 2021, the European Society was able to call on a, a wide spectrum of evidence across the range of surgical risk and conclude that uh, decisions regarding the choice between surgical aortic valve replacements and uh, transcatheter alternatives should be guided by a composite of age, surgical risk scores, and anatomical and clinical factors which underpinned our decision making. Age is not a, a, a sole entity, and it needs to be taken in clinical context along with the life expectancy of a patient. And it needs to be recognized that life expectancy varies very widely in Europe. For example, uh, in Germany, the life expectancy of a patient may be very different from a patient in Romania. And clearly, a cutoff of 75 years is a guideline rather than a, a, a rule for, to, for application in every geographical setting. Nevertheless, in terms of broad recommendations, patients aged less than 65 who are at low surgical risk, uh, 
or patients who are operable and unsuitable for a transfemoral TAVI procedure should undergo intervention by surgery in the normal run of events. Conversely, patients who are 75 years or older or patients who are intermediate or high risk are arguably better served by TAVI. And all patients who sit in the middle of these uh, distinctions should be subject to a rigorous heart team analysis of the clinical, anatomical and procedural factors and make a decision suited for each individual patient. And there are multiple factors, and I won't read this slide and work through these small tables with you, but fundamentally, life expectancy, age, and surgical risk scores, the feasibility or otherwise of TAVI via transfemoral approach, the feasibility of performing TAVI in terms of the risks relating to coronary obstruction, patient prosthesis mismatch, or the availability of devices of a suitable size, the underlying anatomy, be it bicuspid or tricuspid, and finally, the need or otherwise of an, old, uh, an additional surgical procedure, for example, complex coronary artery disease, uh, left ventricular outflow tract remodeling, or indeed mitral or tricuspid valve disease. And all of these factors need to be considered by the heart team before reaching a final treatment choice. In making these recommendations, we need to recognize fundamental uncertainties which continue to surround the field, particularly relating to the need for permanent pacemaker implantation in younger and younger patients. And this will be addressed by Fabian Praz in his talk later in this session. And secondly, the challenges faced by the unknown entity of the durability of transcatheter valves which may not be a clinical question in elderly patients, but certainly present a major challenge to younger patients who may be facing two or even three interventions over their lifetime, which could take a mixture of sequences and patterns according to the quality and the outcomes of the first index procedure. So on that note, I'm going to stop, and I think we're going to hand over Phil to Endrik Trida, who's going to speak on the subject of the first intervention being surgery, making sure that we get it right first time. Hendrik. Can you put the mic for Yeah, thanks. So obviously when we speak about younger patients and low-risk patients, uh, there's still good argument for having surgery as a first choice. Um, and this is done you know, in the vast majority of centers. But that means also that we have to think about how we do surgery. And this is basically my talk. We want to learn what we as surgeons can do to achieve best possible long-term results and to uh, also deliver the best possible target for future valve and valve TAVI. And uh, in addition, I would say that it's very important that if we do surgery, we should do it invasively. I think that should become standard of care to make it the least possible invasive uh, intervention for the patient. We should use pericardial prosthesis uh, where we know the long-term durability. Uh, we should always use the largest possible valves. And this would also account for root enlargement procedures if necessary. And then we can do a perfect TAF and SAF in the future because this is a good target and maybe we can even do a TAF and TAF and SAF in the very future. And this is, of course, all supported by the guidelines, as Bernard has just pointed out. But, you know, there is a dark side of SAVER. And the dark side of SAVER is room for improvement on what we do, at least when we look at the statistics and, and the outcome of uh, randomized trials comparing SAVER to TAVER. One problem that we have to solve and we have to deal with is patient prosthesis mismatch. One problem that we have to deal with is that we implant valves with unknown durability. We also sometimes implant valves that are not good targets for future valve and valve TAVI. That is a problem. And then, of course, as I said, I think full stenotomy should be outdated today for patients undergoing isolated AVR. And this is not the end of the list, basically. Patient prosthesis mismatch is a problem, and we know that from the partner trial. If you just look at the very first partner trial, the partner 1A trial, and look at those patients who showed up with a small aortic annulus, where, of course, the risk of patient prosthesis mismatch is highest, 
60% of those patients went off the operation with severe PPM. And this is uh, something we really have to take care about. This should not happen to that extent. And we also know that uh, the incidence in, in the surgery group was much higher than it was in the TAVI group, in that particular patient group. And this has an impact on long-term outcome of patients, basically. So severe PPM was an independent predictor of two-year mortality in the saver arm, while it was not an independent predictor of mortality in the TAVI arm. And this may be due to the fact that PPM is associated with less regression of LV hypertrophy, and of course, that may be linked to worse outcome for patients. But there are strategies to prevent patient prosthesis mismatch. And uh, this is a nice paper just recently published, uh, giving us some hints on uh, what we should do if a patient shows up with a small annulus. We should definitely calculate the index effective orifice area of standard bioprosthesis. And then we can avoid PPM if we follow those rules, and we may end up in a situation where a patient, according to his body size, is at risk for a PPM, that we then have to do something different than just implant a small valve. And that includes, of course, ARE. ARE means aortic root enlargement techniques, and I think this is very important. And I would rather do this than think about TAVI as first choice in a young patient who is at low risk, just because I want to avoid a bit more complicated surgery. So better surgery means better outcome. I think that we as surgeons must look beyond procedural mortality and must implant valves with the largest possible EOA and must, of course, use standard bioprocesses to make them good targets for valve and valve. And there are various ways of doing it. You can, if there's, uh, the risk of PPM is too small, you can just uh, place the valve superannularly. You can get rid of the pledgets and implant without pledgets. You can implant with this uh, running suture that usually facilitates upsizing by one size. But you can, and this is what I plea for, do root enlargement because it's the most effective way of doing it. And this is how you do it, basically. There are three techniques published. I think the one that's most uh, commonly used is the Manugian technique, where you incise in the non coronary sinus. And it's important not to only incise in the sinus, but you have to split the aortic annulus. You may even have to split the mitral valve annulus below in order to really open up that annulus large enough, and then you can implant a larger valve size. And with that, you would have better hemodynamics, better left ventricular mass regression, better survival, less structural valve deterioration, longer valve durability, and a better target for future valve and valve. So a list, a long list of advantages with the technique. Second is reduction of invasiveness. It's not only cosmetics when we do partial upper sonotomies and very small incisions. It's also about less um, uh, trauma for patient, basically. And patient, of course, also want this. And if I go to a patient who decided for TAVI but is not a good TAVI candidate, if I have this argument on my list, we do it through a five centimeter incision, then I always have him on my side. So it should be part of our armamentarium. Then, of course, we can discuss, when it comes to valve durability, also about mechanical prosthesis. And this is, I think, something that's really something worth discussing about. But um, if I look at the reality in, in, in our countries, it's done in very small numbers only because patients don't want it. They don't want to be dependent on Coumadin. And when we talk about valves as proven durability, I think that's very important. And we have the data. It's, of course, in the past we have sometimes only reported freedom from reoperation, but we have data on valve durability according to structural valve degeneration showing very good long term data for proven valves like the Edwards Perriman valve here. And there are forthcoming technologies that may even improve the situation. This is the Resilia tissue on the Inspirus valve that we talk about that has at least the chance to last longer because, in the animal experience, this uh, valve has proven longer durability compared to the well-known perimount tissue. Future valve and valve options would uh, mean that we do not implant valves anymore with the pericardium uh, soon to the outside of the stent because they are not good targets. That means that we do root enlargement. That means also that we know the size of the valves we implant because the labeled size is not always the size of the inner diameter. And the, if you just look at a couple of valves that are labeled size 25, you, know, you see the differences in inner diameter. It's quite amazing. And then with the Inspirus valve, there's also another feature here. 
you could, if you look at that image, implant a valve that has an expandable stand that then would open up even further in a valve and valve situation. So in summary, patient prosthesis mismatch is limiting the future prospects of patients. Root enlargement techniques are very important and should be done more oftenly. Implanted bioprosthesis should have proven durability and should be good targets for a future TAV uh, in, uh, in valve. A minimum invasive aortic valve replacement should be the standard of care today. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. So thank you so much, Hendrik, uh, for that overview. We're now going to ask Francesca Sire to provide a talk on exactly the same question, but in relation to TAVI. So how do we do our TAVI uh, procedure to the best of our ability to ensure that the best long-term outcome and in planning for future procedures. Francesco. Thank you very much, Bernard. It is uh, not pleasant to see you from remote, but it's nice to see you all. Uh, well, uh, what should we think about when the art team indicates uh, TAVI as the first uh, therapeutic option? Uh, I'm sorry, oh, I don't see my slides. Okay. Uh, can you please control my slides from, uh, from there, because uh, there is a problem, I think. Uh, okay, just to recap, the most uh, uh, central uh, messages that, uh, that Bernard uh, uh, excellently uh, uh, described previously from the guidelines. Uh, what we have now is that TAVI is, uh, uh, in general, recommended as the first choice in patients who are above 74 years old, or who are uh, either at high or prohibitive risk for surgery. Uh, uh, differently, surgery is the first option in patients who are below 75 years and low risk at the same time, whereas all the patients that sit in the middle, so uh, those patients, uh, for those patients, the art team should consider individual clinical, anatomical, and procedural characteristics and decide accordingly uh, between the surgical and transcatheter treatment. But uh, the consequence of these new guidelines, I think we can assume that in the next future, we, we see more and more patients uh, with uh, uh, longer life expectancy that will be referred to, uh, to target. Next slide, please. Okay. Having uh, the need to treat younger and lower risk patients means uh, that uh, as in other conditions, but even more in this situation, that we should aim for a perfect target procedure. And the meaning of perfect target procedure is that we need to minimize periprocedural complications, especially those associated with impairment of long-term uh, outcomes and quality of life. We need to ensure durable clinical results, and we should not jeopardize eventual new procedure either uh, but procedures, but also coronary procedures. At the same time, we need to optimize the resources in order to increase the number of the procedures that we can offer in a time, timely manner to our patients and to limit the cost. And I will try to show you how the EDWAS benchmark program can enable this. Next slide, please. So again, perfect TAVI means uh, 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 limitation of stroke, vascular complications and bleedings are associated with, uh, uh, we know, uh, impairment of long-term outcomes, abrogation of paravalvular leak, single-digit uh, surgical-like new pacemaker rates, and we must be able to redo a TAVI procedure uh, if needed during long-term. And I think it's important also to focus on the fact that we should use uh, THB that are approved for low risk patients and that have already long term data. Next slide, please. So uh, uh, looking at the data, I think there is uh, enough evidence that the Sabian 3 valve and the Sabian 3 ultra are valves that are really associated with excellent clinical outcomes. You can see here how the incidence of cardiac death, stroke, uh, need for re reintervention, and the pacemaker is very, very low with the, using these valves, as well as the incidence of more than mild paravalvular regurgitation. And uh, the Sabian 3 ultra valve also uh, gives some uh, further advantage over the Sabian 3 valve. Next. Focusing on the data of the Sabian 3, this is the first uh, experience in real world, and you can see how many zeros we have in adverse outcomes and how nice 
uh, was uh, uh, very mild, the uh, very low the incidence uh, of more than mild paravalvular regurgitation. So confirming that this, this valve uh, really provides excellent clinical outcomes. Next slide, please. So uh, again, we need to minimize the periprocedural complication. We have also to think about the future. One of the periprocedural complications in implantation of pacemaker, this is not a big issue in the short term, but this may be an issue over even uh, uh, over uh, mid and long term follow up. And we will we will deep dive into this later on during this session. But what is the first uh, uh, way to reduce the incidence of pacemaker? You can see from these uh, meta-analysis, for example, 67 studies, uh, uh, balloon expandable valves were associated with more than 50% uh, reduction of the need for new pacemaker. So using the balloon expandable valves gives you really an advantage on this. Second, second possibility is that uh, we should aim for a high deployment. We have learned that uh, by implanting the valve in a, a more aortic position, a little bit higher in comparison to what we were doing conventionally, uh, we can re really reduce the incidence of uh, uh, conduction disturbances and new pacemaker. You can see here how lower was the incidence of pacemaker and uh, left bundle branch block new onset with the high deployment in comparison with conventional deployment. There are several ways, next slide please, to, to uh, achieve a high deployment, several techniques. Next slide please. Uh, I'd like to quote this one. This is the loosen line technique, uh, which is very reliable and consistently associated with a 90%, 10% uh, implantation depth, in which you position the valve, the, the loosened part, uh, uh, the translucent part of the metallic frame at the level of the anus. And this really provides consistently uh, high implantation depth. Next slide, please. Well, if we think about the future of the patient, as mentioned, we have to think also about the possibility that we need to reaccess coronaries. This is very important. You can see it is quite intuitive that after the first study, uh, uh, a device that has a short metallic frame, an intra-annular device, provides the best solution to, uh, to maintain the coronary uh, access. And you can see indeed in the reaccess study by Marco Barbanti and teams demonstrated that a, a self-expanding valve with the supranular design was as significantly associated with the more complex coronary access and difficulty to have a, 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 a complete engagement of the coronary artery. But if, uh, next slide, please. If this is important for the first procedure, again, uh, we say that uh, treating younger patients, we have to think to the possibility of a second or even a third procedure. So we have also to think about the chances that this patient will get a tab in tab procedure in, in the future. And so in this case, it's not only maintaining coronary access, but it's very important to preserve coronary patency even during the THB and THB procedures. And in this work from the Padua team, it is, uh, uh, there are summarized the main factors that we have to take into account in this case, which are the height of the metallic frame, the design of the metallic frame open or closed cell, intranular versus supranural position, the skirt and the commissural height, and the valve to aortic distance. Uh, taking into consideration all these factors, next slide please, uh, in this uh, CT, uh, elegant CT scan study, uh, it, it was demonstrated that, that the second valve is the one that was associated with be better preservation of, uh, of uh, uh, coronary patency here, uh, and that the predictors of increased risk for impaired coronary access were a small senior tubular junction and uh, a supranal annular uh, device design. Next slide, please. Taking all together in the, this uh, paper, again, from the Padua group, uh, I don't want to go through the details, but this paper excellently showed that uh, the Sabian trival provides the most favorable scenario to preserve coronary access either in the first procedure, but also in the event of uh, uh, the need for subsequent procedure. Okay, next slide, please. So now I'd like to draw your attention to the second important issue, which is that uh, treating more patients required a streamlined procedure. And that uh, represents the rationale and the basis of the uh, Edwards Benchmark Program. Uh, in brief, this is uh, uh, made of a set of 14 validated cut pathways that uh, include uh, risk stratified case selection, 
a, a streamlined periprocedural approach and a standardized post-procedural protocol for uh, transfemoral TAVI. Uh, all this through a partnership between the art teams, the TAVI hospital stakeholders, and the faculty. Next, please. I think that the, the pillars of a streamlined procedure, I cannot go through all the 14 pillars of the benchmark, but the pillars of a streamlined procedure are certainly the use of local anesthesia, mild sedation over general anesthesia, eco-guided vascular access, secondary access radial, and uh, uh, adoption of protocol for early, early mobilization and uh, early discharge. Next slide, please. There, there is uh, already evidence that uh, this uh, uh, is associated with uh, excellent clinical outcomes in several studies. I'd like to quote the 3M and the FASTAVI among them, the most important uh, them. But this is uh, 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 this nice paper presented at TVT and TCT uh, 2021 demonstrated that not only using a minimalist approach is associated with uh, excellent clinical outcomes, but it also may reduce hospital costs. And in this analysis, costs were reduced by 10,000 uh, euro as, uh, together with the reduction of hospitalization, length of stay, uh, you can see all the hospital resource utilization. Next slide, please. So uh, I think that we can conclude that there is a clear need for both an optimal target procedure and optimization of, uh, of uh, resources. In patients with a, a long life expectancy, it is really imperative to have excellent procedural results at, at the same time to leave the door open for potential subsequent procedure, either valvular procedure or coronary procedure. And a streamlined procedure can uh, optimize resources, reduce hospitalization length, increase the number of procedures and reduce also costs while maintaining excellent clinical results. Now, uh, finally, uh, I think uh, it is my pleasure, while uh, I thank you for your attention, to introduce now a video which uh, was recorded by Mark, Mark Spence and his team at the Royal Victoria Hospital in Belfast, uh, illustrating the features of the benchmark program in clinical practice. And I think we are all uh, eager to see this video. Thanks a lot. The Edwards Benchmark is a program which creates a structure around the transcatheter valve program with very clear benchmarked standards. Benchmarking is all about communicating well with patients. The interventional cardiologist is just one strand of about 14 different components. It's really broadening us out beyond that narrow focus on the procedural aspect. Um, it means the wider team are engaged in that whole journey for the patient. The most important part is our TAVI coordinator. The TAVI coordinator is the central point of contact for patients, families, members of the MDT and the patient's consultant. The patient is a 79-year-old man. He'd been uh, first identified with angina a decade ago. He had coronary artery bypass grafting. He was identified as having mild aortic valve disease and he's now developed symptoms of breathlessness and his aortic stenosis is now severe. In order for the same day admissions to be successful, we had to set up a pre-admission clinic that took place one week prior to the patient's admission. This allows us to have matched blood available for use on the morning of the procedure. It allows us to consent the procedure. It is absolutely vital that a patient is accompanied by a family member, next of kin or friend, to hospital appointments. In my conversations with the family, I talk about the nature of the condition of aortic stenosis and how it is likely to progress. I explain the TAVI procedure in detail. These patients are going to be having a procedure under local anaesthetic. It's important that they are aware of what to expect. And I inform patients of the benefits of next day discharge. patient was admitted to hospital at 7.30 on the day of his procedure. We already had same-day admission in place due to the pandemic. We found that patients were entirely satisfied by coming in to hospital on the same day as the procedure. I think uh, following the principles of the benchmarking programme are helpful. We very early recognised the benefits of a 
light touch minimalist approach in the cath lab environment with the objectives of rapid uh, mobilization. Benchmark just gives a structure to that, knowing up front from the CT, the planned access route, using ultrasound guided access, having the team well trained in terms of their expectations of the steps of the procedure. Then optimal implantation depth, achieving the objective of low interference with conduction. Our patients are awake, so we know about their cognitive situation, whether they've had any complications with things like strokes. We check the vascular access before they get off the cath lab table, so there's no surprises with late bleeds or unexpected groin hematomas or vascular complications. And then we make a decision on table about whether we keep things like temporary pacemakers in situ, and that's based on around an algorithm of any change in conduction. The interventional cardiologist doing the procedure clearly communicates the mobilization protocols, setting the foundations in the cath lab for a successful early discharge. I'm very pleased that everything went really as planned. Uh, so a transfemoral transcatheter valve implantation with a 26 Cipian 3. We've got a nice high optimal position and he's on a fast mobilization pathway with a view to him getting home as per benchmark uh, tomorrow morning. Can you hear me okay, Catherine? Yep, uh huh. Yeah, just let you know your dad is through his procedure. That's okay, great. we are happy with everything. The plan that's is home, home tomorrow morning, as we had discussed. Great, that's fantastic. Early mobilisation allows the patient to attend for echocardiogram on the day of the procedure to avoid any unnecessary delays on the morning of discharge. We rapidly get the patient back to their baseline by getting them up on their feet at four hours. Oh, go up here. You made that look easy. This prevents complications such as delirium, infections associated with lying in bed, immobility, falls. We had a good night uh, overall, really. Um, he was then, in keeping with Benchmark, evaluated promptly. Benchmark is a real world um, program, so it allows you to potentially hit the target of your next day discharge, which we achieve in about 80% of our patients. It's really as simple as that, isn't it? <laughs> and Phil, we've covered a lot of ground in the, the series of lectures, from guidelines through to optimal surgery, through to optimal TAVI procedures, and we've seen a very nice uh, illustration from Belfast of how simple a pathway can be. Mm. What are the key questions that have come out of our uh, virtual and studio discussion input? Well, perhaps not surprisingly, there's some interest in the age cutoff and um, why the age cutoff seems to differ between the ESC guidance and the American guidelines. Uh, and Philippe Genera, a number of our colleagues online, is commenting about the arbitrary nature of the age cutoff and suggesting that perhaps we need to think hard about the number of years of expected life remaining uh, with an awareness of life expectancy in different parts of the world. And I think that's a really good point that quite often we get obsessed with the age of patients, but we don't think uh, potentially how many years a patient's going to live. Uh, and I think that's maybe the essence of this session, to try and plan, to develop a lifetime plan for patients, particularly relevant as we move into younger patients. So how's that panned out in Germany, Enrique? I know for a long time you've been perhaps ahead of the evidence and ahead of the guidelines offering TAVI for younger patients. And I know there are German recommendations suggesting that 70 should be the threshold. So how have the surgical community reacted? Um, well, this is a difference between my own opinion and maybe how the surgical community reacted. Um, this is, I have to say, but I don't think we should take these age cutoffs as real cutoffs. It doesn't make sense to look at the patient age and then decide what treatment he should get. That's totally senseless. I think it's much more important to also look for anatomy because we have to have the best, you know, anatomy that features or suits us, um, the one or the other valve, and and that is much more important in my eyes, especially when also compared to the risk of mortality uh, predictions, 
because it, you know this does not tell us the full picture. It's it's much more in our heart team discussions the discussion about uh, what is the life expectancy of patients and what is the anatomy looking like. So we've got about three or four more minutes for questions. Are there some key ones there? Well, I think there's, so there's a good question from Tiago Nolasco, who's, who's here on site, saying what kind of closure device uh, is used in this rapid discharge um, program? And I think that taps into our concerns about what can go wrong after a tavern. We all worry about uh, groin hematomas with, with large bore arterial access. Perhaps we could take that to you, Francesco, in terms of vascular closure and avoiding complications, particularly after a speedy discharge. What, can you, what advice can you offer? Normally we use the, the ProGlide or ProStyle now, uh, and, but I think this is the, 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 you can use the device in which you are more com comfortable. We, now we know that there is some comparison between devices, but I don't, don't think uh, we can still draw a definitive conclusion. But what I can uh, certainly think is that it's very important to observe the patients in the, the early hours after TAVI. Uh, if you achieve the perfect uh, vascular closure and you don't have any problem during the first two hours, then you can be really confident uh, to put the patients uh, uh, walking uh, in the four hours in Belfast. We adopt the six hours protocol, but I think never seen a late, uh, uh, late bleeding in if these conditions are respected. I guess the only other thing to add into the mix is that many of our patients are on anticoagulants for atrial fibrillation for other indications and, uh, and there is a question of when to safely reintroduce these anticoagulation uh, agents. Uh, we're all a bit concerned about introducing them too soon, so that would be some, something that we'd, ha we'd all have to consider. Any other key themes there, Phil? No. Okay, no. I have got one question for you, uh, Enzrik, if I may which is the fact that you spoke about optimal surgery, but I think you perhaps hinted that surgeons aren't always providing it in terms of minimal access, route enlargement as, as a more frequent intervention. How do we take the wider surgical community with us and, and take it forward? Well, as I keep on saying uh, to my interventional cardiology friends, you have to actively ask for that. I mean, if you just send patients for surgery and you don't push these guys, I mean, why don't you just challenge them a bit and say, this is what I expect from you, because this patient is young and he must come back with a larger lab size. And then they're somehow forced to do it because um, it's definitely something they can learn. We don't speak about rocket science here. It's, it's something that every surgeon can learn, and uh, it needs a bit of experience, but not much, so it's doable. So push them. Yeah. And maybe we need to empower our patients to be asking those questions yeah. to surgeons as well. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the patients are ultimately the best advocates for their own care. So maybe the, the, the physicians, the cardiologists and the patients should be putting more pressure on the surgeons. Absolutely. Okay, so let's move on to the next phase of our program. And we're going to focus down now a little bit more on the issue of pacemakers and uh, AV conduction injury. Uh, AV conduction system injury during TAVI procedures and how we avoid pacemakers uh, and their consequences over a longer lifetime journey. Fabian. Thank you very much, Bernard. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to speak about conduction disturbances uh, following TAVI. Um, some of the aspects have been already addressed uh, by Francesco, but uh, uh, let's see um, what, what we can achieve here. So, you know, I think one of the very important concepts uh, that you, we need to understand is that uh, the, the proximity of the AV node and the conduction, disturb the conduction system, uh, the East bundle and the East uh, bifurcation as well uh, with the Arctic valve. So, so that means that in any case, in any intervention you do on the aortic valve, you will expose your patient to uh, additional conduction disturbances, but also uh, that's a very important concept uh, that the disease itself, due to uh, invasive uh, calcification in that region, may also create uh, some conduction disturbances prior any uh, procedure. And that's what we actually see in uh, registry, but also in the randomized trial. And I, I think it's a nice representation 
population, if you look at uh, the prevalence of pacemaker in all randomized trials, you see that these follow uh, actually the age of the patient, but also the surgical risk. So in low risk uh, trial, you have a, a prevalence of pacemaker prior to TAVI of about 3%. But then if you go to more high risk trial, then you see and more elderly patient as well, you see that this prevalence is increasing. And this is also you know, the same in registry, as the example of our own registry in Bern. You see that more than half of the patients have already conduction disturbances that are relevant and that you can see on, on EKG uh, before you have done uh, any, any procedure. And about 10% of the patient in our registry present with pacemaker. So that's the first step, pre-existing conduction disturbances, but there are also other predictors you need to be aware of when planning your procedure. So that's uh, the balloon dilatation, pre and post, that uh, the oversizing of the prosthesis. Also the type of the prosthesis is important. We will come back on this uh, uh, later. And the implantation uh, death, as already mentioned. But there are also some anatomical, more maybe more discrete, more uh, detailed um, anatomical factor in the patient uh, that you can look at on CT scan, that's the uh, lens of the membrane septum uh, and the calcification in the device landing dome. There have been also study uh, associated calcification of the mitral annulus with conduction disturbances. I mentioned this already, uh, the, the, this is a meta-analysis from our, our own group, and you see that the rate of pacemaker, which is increased in the overall population compared to surgical artery valve replacement, is uh, actually driven by self-expanding uh, valve with uh, three times uh, uh, increase hazard ratio for pacemaker implantation. And this is also constant. Uh, you just look here at the line in all uh, the different devices. You see that self-expanding devices have a higher rate of pacemaker, uh, but also decreasing, as you see, because of the, uh, of the um, uh, improvement of the implantation technique. And it's also true for balloon expanding valve. We have talked about high implantation of the sapien valve. And you see that very recent data show very low pacemaker rates. So how does this impact on, on our patient? And that's a big discussion. We don't know exactly. But what is interesting to see is um, uh, what happened in a patient with new on later than discharge during the, the, during the follow-up that may actually impact on the prognosis of that patient. And we have very conflicting data. I show here two large registry data with long-term follow-up. And you see on the, on the left side, there is an impact on mortality for, left, for new onset left bone ground block. And on the right side, no impact. And the same applies for pacemaker. On the left side, you have a large registry with five-year follow-up with impact on mortality, more than 800 patients. And on the right side, again, 10-year analysis in Sweden uh, and no impact on mortality. So what we traditionally do in that situation is so if you have pre-existing right button branch block, we monitor the patient and add temporary pacing for 24 hours. It's the same in case of new uh, conduction disturbances. And in other cases, as we just saw now, you can discharge a patient early. Some patients, we don't know exactly who, may also qualify for ambulatory rate monitoring. And uh, we have done a study also in Bern on that, uh, that is under publication. Uh, you will see uh, in about 10% of the patient a new indication for pacemaker after discharge. So it's a low proportion of patients. And most of them, I would say almost 90% of that patient, developed that during the first 30 days. You can see also our new monitoring uh, capacities like uh, uh, smart watch or, or uh, alter monitoring for that patient at risk. And then finally, uh, think about potential complications. So we don't know exactly what is the impact of that pacemaker. And you can have late complication as well, infection. And I would like to mention also the lead induced tricuspid regurgitation, which we don't know exactly in how much patient this uh, appear and can play a role also on long term prognosis. So the guideline reflects a little bit what has been uh, what has been mentioned. There is of course no indication for prophylactic implantation of pacemaker, and uh, there is a need for a continuous look on the evolution of conduction disturbances during the hospitalization of the patient that may uh, drive the need for, uh, for ambulatory monitoring. So uh, in conclusion, of how conduction disturbances uh, and pacemaker implantation are device dependent and are frequent after TAVI, we don't know exactly what is the prognosis of this, but this has consequences of the left ventricular function. And of course, this needs to be taken into consideration for risk gratification, post-procedural monitoring, and discharge planning, basically at every single step of the treatment of TAVI patient. Thank you very much.
So thank you very much, Fabian. You've demonstrated very clearly to us that whilst a pacemaker in an 85-year-old lady with six coexisting conditions is not a big problem, it's clearly a very important consideration in the younger and younger patients that we're now encountering after TAVI or TAVA. So, Enrique, what's the surgical comparator, firstly? What, what do we know about rates of pacemaker requirement after conventional surgical AVR? Yeah, first of all, there are pacemakers after surgery, for sure. Um, it's not in, in large numbers, about 3 to 4% pacemaker rate. And, um, and, uh, but as we've seen you know, from uh, Fabian, it's the same number if you do TAVI right and if you calculate for, for the measures. The question I would have, if I may, um, you did not speak so much about the length of the membrane septum. What I think is very important to measure uh, before you do TAVI that also predicts somehow the risk of pacemakers and may help in choosing the right prosthesis. Is that something you always uh, look up in every patient? And I have to say that we, we don't do this in, in all patients, and we, we, we probably we need to improve this a little bit in, in our assessment of the CT scan. What we look at is the calcification, and calcification in that uh, region, you know, for, for several reasons, actually, also for the risk of annular rupture and, and chunts toward the right side of the heart. Um, and, and, but there is also, I have to say, conflicting data a bit on that. So some studies have shown that calcification may increase pacemaker rate, that MAC may increase pacemaker rate as well, but also uh, also from our, from our own center did not show that in all patients which may relate to, to some anatomical uh, factor and also to the practice you have in implanting pacemaker. I think there, is, there are some differences there as well. Some centers are more uh, liberal in the, in the indication yeah. of pacemaker and other less. Phil, have we got any questions there from our, from our participants? Um, unfortunately, the chat function has gone offline transiently, but has come back now, so I'm hoping to get some, uh, some questions in. But, but I had a comment to, to Fabian, if I may, or a question, is that when we're moving into younger patients, of course, we fear pacemakers more, as Bernard has articulated. But is it true that young patients are perhaps less likely to receive pacemakers because they have a healthier conducting system and so could, could that be sort of offset our fear to a certain extent if, if you compare a 68-year-old, 72-year-old conducting system with a 90-year-old conducting system, you're perhaps less likely to uh, injure the conducting system as easily? That's, that's maybe a factor. I'm not aware of data on, on that, uh, particularly depending on the, on the age of the patient. Uh, but you know, I think that could be a, a factor, but we have to see that this population of patients has aortic stenosis anyway. So they have uh, some risk factor uh, to develop this uh, even before. But as I show in the randomized trial, uh, the prevalence is less in younger patients. So I, I agree, probably uh, they will be less likely to, to have this complication. There's just a question from Philippe, uh, our chat master, and, and maybe uh, I could direct it to, to you, Hendrik, is if, if there is a short member reception, septum, what do you do differently? I mean, if you, you, you have that information, do you just try and put the implant higher or, or uh, avoid oversizing, or do you do something else to counter that anatomical feature? Yeah, two things. First is that you really try doing the procedure to achieve the highest possible position of the valve, whatever valve you use. That's one thing. The other thing is that if you see that, the risk of, um, of uh, pacemaker dependency is higher. So uh, that's also good to know, when, especially when you have these very straightforward next time discharge uh, um, procedures planned, that you have that in mind. And you know, this is a patient that has particular risk for conduction disturbance yeah. and needs uh, maybe um, a pacemaker lead for a little longer than, than just for the procedure. We've talked a little bit, of, and we've seen on the slides some algorithms that individual institutions have for, for their monitoring of uh, conduction disturbances and thresholds for pacemaker implantation. But our final question is to Francesco, which relates to left bundle branch block, because this is not infrequent after TAVI, and we're never quite sure what to do. Conventionally, it wouldn't be a, a, an indication for a permanent pacemaker but should we be taking a more aggressive approach to pacemaker implantation for this group? Uh, I can give you my personal opinion here. I don't think uh, that that is the case. Uh, I know that uh, several algorithms and many centers uh, adopt these algorithms for a longer observation in patients who develop, develop left bundle branch block. I think that especially with the balloon expandable valves, 
Uh, this is not should not be considered as a trigger for pacemaker implantation, and you sh you could be uh, safe enough in also early discharge of the patient, uh, provided there are not additional conduction disturbances associated. Of course, this is not uh, something which is de desirable. Having a left band branch block, that I think. Uh, uh, no, it cannot actually, also in a study, multi-center study that we did, we also observed the many patients implanted with pacemaker, either with the self-expanded or balloon expandable valves, a very, very low rate of pacing over the, uh, the time, over long-term follow-up. Uh, so uh, actually this calls for a reduction of the indications. We still don't know how, uh, because at the center point, certainly those patients had indications. So I'm not saying that they should have not received the pacing, but uh, uh, it's just a, a warning to not be too aggressive in implanting new pacemakers. So thanks, Francesco. I think we've got time for one quick question, Phil. Yeah, it was just about the indications for pacing. Fabian alluded to it, is that, that the indications for pacing are variable and people's threshold is variable. And the surgeons have a luxury of a few days of waiting for the block to recover. And I think quite often, if we waited, the blocks that we see after TAVI would recover. And if you look at the, pa uh, the patient's pacemaker usage, it's often negligible. Uh, six months down the line. So, so I think that there is a little bit more to learn, but I think this variable threshold we do need to address as a community and try and get some real uh, consensus opinion as to when to implant a pacemaker and when not to. Well, I think that's a fantastic point to conclude with, Phil. Uh, I think it's been a, a very wide-ranging discussion. We've had some fantastic insights from the presentations, uh, both from surgical and interventional perspectives. I think the takeaway message is that the first cut is the deepest, as Francesco put it. And it's very important, it's incumbent on all of us, whether we are surgeons or interventionists, to make sure that our first procedure is performed in the most optimal way uh, to negate the risks of paravalve leak, aortic regurgitation, uh, vascular access complications, and as we have highlighted specifically, the long-term issues in relation to permanent pacemaker requirements.